to, to be here. Thank you to the organizers for putting this together. I think it's a great topic. It's very timely. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to be telling you about uh, some work we've been doing in my lab at Zilla uh, at the University of Colorado. Um, and um, this is about as fancy as the graphics are going to get. You're going to get a lot of uh, PowerPoint graphics after this. Um, <laughs> but uh, really what, what we're going to be talking about is, is the idea of creating connections between atoms inside of a cavity. But the, the context of you know, why we think this is interesting to do, uh, you know, I think Monica gave this nice sort of viewpoint of sort of the uh, useful and sort of who knows if it's useful, I think is a better way of putting it. But maybe it can turn out to be tremendously useful forms of entanglement and interactions. We're a little more towards the uh, exploring what we, can, what we can actually build in the lab and also with an eye towards whether or not we can exploit it to do something interesting. So as experimentalists in cold atom physics, um, on a good day in the lab, we actually have near complete control over single atoms. So we can control their internal states. Uh, we can uh, do pi pulses, pi over two pulses, coherent rotations between internal states. We can uh, laser pull and trap, so that's controlling the external states of the atoms. And so the question is, uh, actually decades and decades of work went into getting that type of control. So what do we do with it? Well, typically what we do in AMO physics is we take advantage of the fact that these atoms are identical with each other to do metrology, to make measurements of our universe. And so if we have control of one atom, what we do in the field of precision measurement is usually not use one atom, but we actually use n atoms, and we run n copies of the same experiment in parallel. But in precision measurement, ideally these experiments would all run in parallel and not know about each other. Okay? You don't want them to interact. You don't want them to do something collective. Okay. Turns out this has been extremely powerful. So you can build incredible atomic clocks, you can build uh, incredible uh, accelerate, accelerometers, you can do tests of QED, you can determine fundamental constants, all kinds of fundamental applications. Uh, but one question would be, what's next? Can we go beyond sort of just building n copies of the same experiment and running them all in parallel with each other? In particular, we're interested in asking the question, in the context of making precision measurements with atoms, what are things you can do with many quantum objects that you fundamentally can't do with one? Okay, so we want collective effects. So what we mean by this is I'm trying to sort of draw the diagram here, is instead of being independent atoms, somehow now they're connected. They're connected either through classical correlations or quantum correlations in the form of entanglement. Okay. In our system, the way we're actually going to introduce those sort of blue connections between these atoms is actually by putting these atoms inside an optical cavity between two mirrors, and we're going to let them interact with that cavity mode to create those correlations in entanglement. So that's the, the broadest overview of what we're doing. And I'm going to tell you about three specific experiments. Uh, one is going to be our work on phase sensing below the standard quantum limit. And so the idea is we're going to actually uh, measure the quantum noise associated with the atoms and somehow subtract it out. And the goal here is to generate large amounts of entanglement enhancement uh, for quantum sensors. The second topic is going to be looking at uh, breaking through uh, thermal limits on laser frequency or phase noise. Uh, this has actually been a tremendously hard problem in the field. And this is a uh, path that could be thousands of times more sensitive uh, to this uh, fundamental problem of thermal Brownian motion of mirror cavities. And so the goal is 100 times reduction in laser line width for frequency length and maybe even gravity neutrality at some point. The last topic, which is the newest topic, I think this is the second time I've talked about it, um, it's pretty recent, is actually operating in a regime where we can observe uh, mean field interactions uh, characterizing spin exchange interactions mediated by cavity mode in this system. Okay. The goal here is that we can create uh, twisting dynamics uh, and create many body energy gaps for entanglement and stabilization of the many body state against single particle phases. So th those are the three main topics. Uh, for today. Uh, I'm not going to show you very much about the experiments, but here they are. <laughs> um, I'm showing this to give you that sense of it's a cold atom experiment. There are lots of lasers, lots of electronics. They're ultra high vacuum chambers. That's the type of experiment we're doing. Uh, Kevin is actually here in the audience, or I think is in the audience somewhere. Yeah, there he is. Uh, and so Kevin was over here. He's, he's now at ARL doing a postdoc. Uh, he's tuning at the rubidium experiment, which is a table here and another table you're not seeing back here. Um, the other experiment I'm going to talk about is the strontium experiment. This is Matt. He just graduated with his PhD. He's sticking around at Chilla. Uh, 
Uh, and he's working on the astronomy experiment, which is a table here and another table you're not seeing over here. But in both cases, if you come visit us, and please do, uh, you can come to the lab and what you would see are uh, two uh, optical cavities. On the rubidium side over here, uh, there's a cavity here. The spacing is about two centimeters between those meters. So big and macroscopic. What you're seeing is fluorescence uh, from atoms are laser pulled and trapped along the axis of that cavity in a 1D uh, intracavity standing wave of light. Okay. On the strontium side, this is actually the spacer. It's a main core spacer. There's a mirror here and a mirror here. Again, about five centimeters is the typical length here. That little smudge is laser cooled. Strontium atoms are going to be loaded into a similar configuration inside that cavity. Those are the two main experimental configurations. So the first experiment I'm going to tell you about is actually operating. It's, it's work that uh, Kevin was really the lead on on the rubidium experiment. And that's the idea of breaking through what's known as the standard quantum limit. Okay. And the idea of what this picture is trying to show is that instead of having independent atoms, there's this kind of ethereal stuff called entanglement that's going to link, the, link these atoms and create what are known as spin squeeze states. Okay, that's the broad story. How are we going to generate these spin squeeze states? Uh, the way we're going to do it is we're actually going to pretend as though the quantum noise is classical noise, and we're going to measure it, and we're going to subtract it out. Just like you would do for any classical noise in the lab, you would say, I've got noise, I'm going to build a servo, and I'm going to subtract it out. It's really the same concept. The difference is that here, the noise is actually being provided by quantum mechanics itself. It's a quantum fuzziness in the orientation of a pseudo spin of n spin one half atoms. Okay. If I actually you know, begin by optically pumping into the ground state and I do a pi over two pulse to put each atom in a superposition and spin up and spin down, there is some uncertainty from trial to trial well where I will measure that block vector pointing. That's represented by this sort of fuzziness. It turns out that in almost all precision measurements, your job is to make some angle accrue during some measurement time and then try and estimate the angle that was accrued. And it's this quantum fuzziness that limits your angular resolution to 1 over square root of n radians that limits the precision of your sensor in a fundamental way. So how are we going to actually measure the orientation of this block vector? Well, let's measure the polar angle here as measured from, say, the deviation from the equator. That's measuring the spin projection JZ. Well, that's a little bit abstract. What do you really mean? We really mean how many ions are in spin up versus spin down. It's the difference of those two. That's what the real measurement is. Okay. So great, let's just do that. And we'll measure that it's pointing somewhere in theta, and that will localize the state. There's the localized state. Easy, right? Well, people measure populations all the time, but they don't create squeeze states. So what's different? Typically, when an experimentalist turns on a laser beam and scatters photons off of, off of his atoms in order to measure the number of atoms in spin up, the universe also gains information about which atoms are in spin up and which atoms are in spin down. So that, in fact, the individual atoms collapse into either spin up or spin down. So that roughly half the atoms will collapse into up, half the atoms will collapse into down, and you're, you're in a product state of those two. Why is that less interesting? It's less interesting because if I have some signal I'm trying to detect, that signal will rotate this vector. And I want to see that as a change in the projection of the vector onto, say, the z-axis. But if I take this back-to-back -back vectors, they have almost zero length. And so when I rotate it, I will get no signal. The projection onto the z-axis will barely change. So what the point is, this squeeze state is different because I actually don't collapse the individual atoms. It's a collective measurement where I gain no information, even in principle, about which atoms are in spin up and which are in spin down. And by doing that, I actually maintain the length of my block vector, and I get enhanced angular resolution. So the entanglement witness for uh, knowing that you've actually entangled the atoms is that you have a phase resolution that's better than 1 over the square root for the number of atoms in radians. That's what we want. We're doing this in a cavity system. Here's just a close-up of uh, the cavity here. The spacing is 2 centimeters. Uh, for uh, whatever your background, choose your favorite parameter here. We've seen these enough. You know what they, they are. But this is a small c limit. Uh, the single particle property is about 10 to minus 2. But on the other hand, the number of atoms is about 10 to 5 to 10 to 6. So n times c is very large, and that's the number we actually care about. The actual uh, spin half system are two ground hyperfine states of rubidium separated by about 6.8 gigahertz of microwave frequency. And so we can optically pump them to spin down and use microwaves to do pi over two rotations and put atoms in superpositions of here and here. 
There's an optically excited state. You know, this is 6.8 gigahertz, but at 10 to the 14 hertz, there's an optical transition here. <laughs> we tune a cavity mode to be close to resonance with the up to E transition sitting here in frequency space. If no atoms are in, in spin up, the cavity mode sits here. But if I put atoms in spin up, I get a dispersive shift of the, of the cavity resonance frequency. James coming, yada, yada, yada. Basically, atoms in spin up look like a little piece of glass. Changes the optical path length between the mirrors and the cavity resonance frequency shifts. So all we have to do is measure this uh, frequency shift very, very precisely, and we can back out the number of atoms in up. But because we're detecting the output of a single mode of this optical cavity, we don't gain any information about <coughs> which atoms are in spin up. That's the collective measurement that we want. So uh, just to give you a sense of how hard this is, the cavity line width is about three megahertz. Um, and from trial to trial, the, the quantum projection noise, the fuzziness of the state, will cause this uh, frequency to jitter by about 100 kilohertz. So we start doing something interesting once we can split this line to 100 kilohertz or better. <coughs> OK, so I said it was going to be basically a measurement and subtract process. So how does that actually look? Here's, here's real data. The experimental sequence is this. I begin by optically pumping all the atoms into spin down. We apply microwaves to do a pi over two pulse to put each atom in a superposition of spin up and spin down. And then what we do is we can either apply an additional small rotation or not. It's through a few milliradians. It's a rotation of theta. Okay? It's kind of a you know, cartoon picture. It's the difference between, say, the blue distribution here and the red distribution. And then we make a dispersive, uh, a measurement of the dispersive shift of cavity mode. It's, it's shift in resonance frequency. That tells us the spin projection Jz, and we label the measurement outcome on a given trial Jz sub f for the final measurement of the spin projection Jz. We can then repeat this experiment many times, many independent times. When we do that, here's the trial number. And for when we do the blue sequence with no additional rotation psi, we get that. And when we do the red sequence we get uh, without, with the rotation, we get this spread. And the noise you're seeing here is almost pure quantum noise. It's the quantum noise along this axis. Okay. For this kind of small rotation, you can barely tell on a single trial whether it's from the red distribution or the blue distribution. So now let's do something about that. What we're going to do is modify the sequence a teeny, uh, teeny bit. Before choosing to do this small rotation or not, we are going to make a dispersive uh, a measurement of the dispersive shift of the cavity resonance frequency to tell us the spin projection Jz, and we're going to label the measurement outcome Jz sub p for pre-measurement. And now what we're going to look at versus trial number is the differential quantity Jz final <coughs> minus Jz pre, hoping that the quantum noise will subtract in that difference, but this angry angular deflection that sits in between will, will still show up. So this is what it looks like. Okay. So we can really subtract off that quantum noise, and yet you can see that these two states have different spin projections, Jz, indicating that you know, in a cartoon picture, here's what we're preparing. So this is telling you that both you have reduced the noise and you've maintained your signal. And therefore, you have more angular resolution in this system. So how well can we do? Uh, oh, I want to make one comment. In the literature, sometimes this is referred to as conditional squeezing, but I want to point out it's really deterministic. There's no post-selection involved Every single trial gives us a usable result okay, with enhanced uh, phase resolution. Uh, oh, why can these points be quieter than those? Well, it really is because of entanglement. And one way to think about what's happening is the measurement pro uh, projects the system into a state where normally, if later I were to go and ask, is atom number 100 in spin up, it could sort of 50 50 go into spin up or spin down. So let's say this time it went into spin up. Normally, atom number 101 would not know about that. It would also independently choose. But as a result of the entanglement, it biases the next atom to be more likely to collapse and to spin down. And it's the entanglement that provides that correlation and collapse process so that they partially cancel each other's noise. And that's why entanglement is important for this. Uh, so uh, how are we doing? Well, it turns out this idea of using entanglement for enhancing precision uh, you know, some of the first experiments were back in the early 2000s in Dave Weinland's group. Uh, people then had figured out how to let atoms collide with each other to create uh, entanglement between atoms. And then people have been using this kind of measurement technique, which are the solid dots here uh, over time. 
And in our experiments, uh, where are the red points here? I should say on the vertical. This is the improvement over the standard quantum limit in phase noise variance. Okay. <coughs> Um, and so one means are at the standard quantum limit. Uh, we're now up at around 18 dB, and uh, Mark Kasevich uh, also has a wonderful result uh, up at about the same level. Okay. So this is about a factor of, you know, like 50 or 60 dB on the standard quantum limit. Sort of yeah. One thing I want to emphasize about this is uh, this is the directly obser observed angular enhancement without uh, background subtractions or corrections or if I had a better single photon counter or something, right? Like it, this is what we see coming out of the experiment. And from a precision measurement perspective, we think this is really important for saying, okay, we know how to create lots of entanglement now, and now we can start thinking next steps, like, okay, can we map this onto, onto quantum sensors and use it as a resource? We, in our strontium system, I won't talk about it, but we've also applied this kind of, sometimes called a quantum non-demolition measurement. It's a different kind of QND than people use for single qubits. We mean it in a different way, whatever. It's a collective measurement. But we've done it using a spin-forbidden transition uh, in strontium and said that, yeah, it looks like this would be a really great way to create entanglement in a strontium optical glass clock. Okay, so with that, um, I'm just going to summarize uh, a few more recent results. Uh, we also have a paper where we demonstrate that we could use the outcome of the pre-measurement that would localize the state, and then we could actually apply real-time real feedback to steer towards a target value of Jz. So it's just kind of a, you know inserting a feedback step into that pre-measurement, final measurement process. We've also uh, demonstrated that we could actually let the convert the intracavity 1D lattice into an effective optical dipole trap and let the atoms fall and actually do time average measurements of the cavity frequency shift. And this allows us to prepare a kind of homogeneous squeezing that's equally shared among all the atoms would be appropriate for matter wave interferometry, which we think would be a really good application for these kinds of states. Uh, since I was talking about atom interferometry, uh, there are actually two really interesting results uh, out there. Let's see if it holds up. Uh, that proposed that you could go do gravitational wave detection using either atom interferometers or optical lattice clocks. And they're kind of presented as being related, but it was a little unclear, like, are these the same things? Atom interferometers involve sequences called large momentum transfer. What's that about? Um, that doesn't happen in clocks. What's going on? Uh, and, and really, kind of, what's the fundamental role of the atoms? What are the atoms really doing for you in these proposals? And we, we, we have a paper out in the archive that at least clarifies for us sort of you know, the answer to these questions. <laughs> okay, so the next topic I'm going to talk about is uh, overcoming uh, thermal limits on laser frequency or phase noise. And the idea here is what we're going to do is store the, the phase information primarily inside the atoms rather than the photon field that's bouncing back and forth between these mirrors because it turns out that photon field will get quickly scrambled by ripples of the mirror surfaces caused by thermal grounding. So the goal here is to think about building a, a, a more uh, a single frequency laser, in some sense a sharper ruler. So we can visualize that by saying when we started this work, the best uh, lasers out there had a coherence link, you could think of it as a ruler, that would extend from about the Earth to the moon, maybe a few times back and forth. Uh, we think that this could be a path to actually building uh, lasers with line widths or coherence links that would all extend all the way, say, from the Earth uh, from the Earth to the Sun. Okay. So it would be a pretty pretty dramatic improvement. So you can think about very long baseline optical interferometry that turns out the local oscillator noise, the laser frequency noise, is a dominant source of noise in those experiments. And this would be a huge improvement if we could achieve this. So let me step back and tell you the, the, the main like big idea here. The big idea is to say, look, uh, the best uh, lasers we know how to build, we take advantage of a passive optical reference cavity, here's a mirror, here's a mirror, and you try and hold the distance between those mirrors very fixed, that defines the resonance frequency, and then you take a normal laser and you steer the frequency of that laser to match the resonance frequency of this empty cavity. So you uh, build careful vibration isolation systems so that walking around the lab and talking and all this kind of stuff doesn't actually cause that, that limit to jiggle and wiggle. You get rid of that and it still looks like the cavity length is actually fluctuating. Uh, well, it turns out that there's actual thermal grounding motion of the mirrors that compo compose the actual uh, reflective coating, the mirror substrates, and the spacer. So it's really, they're just all jiggling around it with KT energy. 
So that's that's a really hard problem. It's a thermal limitation. Um, and so in 2009, uh, Agila, Dominic Meiser, Junyi uh, Carlson, and Murray Holland uh, proposed, hey, look, what if we just built a laser directly using very narrow alignment transitions in atoms such as strontium, ytterbium, calcium, et cetera, and take advantage of these really high Q transitions uh, instead. So what I'm going to be telling you about is actually lazy on an ultra-narrow atomic transition. In particular, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of a triplet P0 to singlet S0 transition in strontium. This is a triplet to singlet, which means it shouldn't be. As a result, uh, it ends up with an extremely long radiative lifetime of 150 seconds. That's crazy long. It's longer than I must spend on this slide. Okay? <laughs> Adam shouldn't be allowed to do that. But it's because of this double, doubly forbidden nature of the transition. Okay? In terms of alignment, that means it's a millihertz line of transition. That's what we're talking about. What we're going to do is we're going to pack about 100,000 of those atoms in between two mirrors. We're going to put them in the optically excited state, and we're going to turn them into the gain medium for a laser. And we're going to actually make this millihertz line of transition laser. If you can do this, uh, the prediction is that you can be more than 10,000 times less sensitive to cavity frequency noise by doing this. Uh, and if you work out the equivalent of what's known as a shallow towns line width, which is a fundamental quantum phase diffusion process that present in lasers, uh, that you would predict that that's basically order C, single particle cooperativity parameter, times the excited state line width of a millihertz. So it would say the shallow towns line width could be at or below a millihertz. I'm not going to talk about, it turns out we did some experiments using Raman transitions to simulate this type of transition. Uh, we've thought about dressing this kind of laser with Rydberg states. We've seen this kind of lazy on a 7.5 kilohertz transition, which is only singly forbidden. And we've also seen some magnetically induced transparency stuff inside this cavity on a narrow transition. But that's other work I won't go into, but it's related to this. So why is it interesting to use this very narrow transition? Well, the reason it's interesting is because in a standard optical laser, the gain medium has a width, which I'll describe by gamma perp here, which is actually very broad. It means the gain medium is very coherent. Whereas the cavity line that's described by kappa is quite narrow. And what that means is if I shift the cavity resonance frequency, the lasing frequency will almost follow one-to-one -one the cavity resonance frequency. That makes you very sensitive to vibrations in the system. In this case, we're building what's called a superradiant laser, or really this is sort of a, a, a old story by being retold in the optical domain. It's essentially a maser. Okay? The roles are completely reversed. The cavity line width is now very broad, and the gain medium is ultra narrow here. And as a result, even if I shift this broad sort of spectrum of the cavity, the lasing frequency will almost be completely pinned to the atomic transition frequency. So it's going to be the atoms that sets the lasing Okay, so uh, here are some experimental parameters uh, for that system. Cavity length is 5 centimeters, 30,000 finesse, line with 150 kilohertz, single particle cooperativity of 0.4, and 10 to the 5 uh, strontium atoms. We laser cool uh, and trap at 5 microkelvin. We actually do this. I will point to this paper using a novel adiabatic passage MOT and laser cooling scheme that we discovered in the lab and we think it's actually kind of cool. It might actually be interesting for uh, laser cooling of molecules in the future. Um, we actually trap in what's known as an intercavity magic wavelength lattice. We actually build up a standing wave inside this cavity on another longitudinal mode at 813 nanometers, and the point of that is that it creates a trapping potential that creates a trapping potential which is the same for the ground state as the excited state, so that the differential shift is zero and the lasing transition is not perturbed. That's why it's called magic. So it allows us to have very, very narrow uh, optical transitions unperturbed by the trap. We trap in the Lambicki regime, which just means that, uh, think of it as we don't have to worry about Doppler shifts. Here's what we actually see at t equals zero. We optically pump all the atoms into the excited state, and then we wait. Nothing happens. We look at the output power from the cavity, nothing, 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 and then suddenly a burst of light builds up and then dies off. And this is exactly the kind of physics that was explored by Serge Roche and others uh, many years ago with Rydberg atoms and cavities, exploring collective superradiants. We can do that for different atom numbers, 200,000, 150,000, 125,000, 100,000. You can actually look at the peak output power as a function of the atom number, and we see that it has this kind of n-squared scaling, which is the collective enhancement in the emission rate for that peak output power that you expect for superradiants. Uh, you can also define a threshold atom number that has to do with single particle dephasing that you have in the system that sets the scale of that number. 
So we think this is exactly what we want. This is stimulated emission. If we had to wait on that 150 second live time before we got a photon, we'd just be starved for photons. We wouldn't be able to build a phase lock out of that system at all. So we really need this, this large stimulation process. It is a large stimulation process, because note that we're getting about, roughly half the atoms are giving us a photon in roughly about 50 milliseconds. But the single particle decay rate has had a lifetime of 150 seconds. So there's many orders of magnitude of stimulation. I didn't tell you this, but it turns out the strontium we're working with is 87 strontium. It has a nuclear spin 9 halves, so actually we have lots of excited states and lots of ground states. Uh, these are nuclear spin states. We can optically pump half the atoms into this state and half the atoms into that state. And then we, if we look at the output, we see there are two frequency components coming out. They laze independently. And we can detect that. If you take the average frequency between these, it turns out it can be very, very insensitive to magnetic field noise, which is also very important. Well, if you can do two, why don't we do them all? So we uh, populate all the excited states. Uh, we actually do a coherent rotation from the South Pole to just off the North Pole. So in some sense, we're writing in a, a we're pre-writing a phase into the system, and then we let it go, and it evolves to the, to the South Pole again. And so what you're seeing now, this is the output power as a function of time. It's the fact that you have more Fourier components. So you can get constructive interference. Those are the peaks between all these emissions. And then you get destructive interference as they get out of phase with each other because we have a magnetic field bond that makes the transition frequencies not quite degenerate with each other. So you can imagine that, you know, in some sense, like what is Ramsey, which I think of as like the only good spectroscopy is Ramsey spectroscopy. Ramsey, in the end, is just saying, what is a, I need to estimate how much phase accumulated during some time T. That's all Ramsey is, okay? And so you can think of it as, I can look at the phase of the laser light here, and then no light would come out, and then the phase of the laser light here, and I'm going to take the phase difference, that's the amount of phase that accumulated in the dark. So you could essentially think of this as kind of somewhere in between a passive and active uh, kind of system, where you do all of your readout, not in terms of populations, but in terms of the phase of the light that comes out of the gap. Um, I will also point out that, you know, in the past, people have thought about SUN uh, symmetries in the system and the fact that you can have many different interacting spin states and using this as perhaps a, a synthetic uh, degree of freedom, you know, like a, another coordinate in your system. I'm not sure where that's going, but we've got all these states available, so if people have clever ideas, um, we can actually allow them to interact with each other and think about multi-mode entanglement and correlations between these different spin manifolds. One of the reasons we're building this, I said at the beginning, was because we wanted to build a very narrow uh, laser source. So we've actually um, got a fiber that runs down to June Yee's lab just down the hall. And oh, when you know it, he has you know, like some of the world's best optical reference cavities in his lab. So we can actually uh, do fiber phase noise cancellation and bring that light down to our lab. And then we can beat uh, the pulses of light coming out of our system with his laser light. So here's a heterodyne uh, power spectrum over here. It's just one of the first ones we had. But what we can do is we can ask, we run this, we get 50 millisecond pulses of light, we do that once a second, okay? And we can just ask, what's the frequency stability of that pulse of light that comes out as a function of time? In the clock world, we use something called the Allen deviation to describe this, it's the fractional frequency instability. And if you measure for longer, if you integrate over more pulses, you can average down noise. Uh, but if you look at one second, uh, that's this point, and when we really tune things up, we got this blue point here. It's a fractional frequency instability that's around 7 to 10 times 10 to minus 16 at one second. Um, if you don't live in the clock world, that's actually a really good number. Okay. Um, well, you know, who knows? Uh, it's amazing what you can do in the clock world. Uh, we are happy with this in part because we uh, did some measurements that showed the short-term stability is actually limited by photon shot noise. Like if I had more photons, I could split that line uh, more precisely. And uh, roughly half the noise uh, is actually coming from the optical reference cavity. And I, maybe I didn't mention it, but this is like a Ferrari of optical reference data. So the fact that we're like even to a point where like half the noise of this measurement is coming from the reference data, we're very happy with. Um, that's the precision. You can also ask about accuracy. So while we're actually doing comparisons between this reference cavity and the light from our uh, super radiant laser, they can also calibrate this versus a strontium optical last clock in June's lab. Uh, and at this point, the level of agreement we can understand to about 2 plus or minus 4 times 10 to minus 15. The goal here is not to compete on absolute accuracy with passive optical clocks, but instead build something that plays the role of a maser, right? Something that gives you good short-term stability that can be steered at long-term by passive uh, uh, clocks if you need that. 
if that's a requirement of whatever your, your experiment is. So we're, we're already very happy with that. Um, where this is going is we're actually uh, beginning to build a system uh, that's going to move us towards uh, continuous lazy, uh, where we're going to continuously load items into a MOT, put them into a ring cavity, make them laze in this region, load in this region. Uh, we think this is encouraging because simple scaling arguments would say if we could turn this into a CW laser, we could take that short-term stability and actually push it down to about 6 times 10 to the minus 18, which means that if we were to move this laser up uh, by about 6 centimeters, we could resolve the change in the ticking rate due to GR in one second. So we think that's you know, it's starting to be interesting. You can measure where you are in gravitational potential with high bandwidth. You can already reach this kind of stability, but you have to average for like, you know, 20,000 seconds, oh, that's too much, uh, uh, 1,000 seconds to reach So will this be the new way that we measure people's height? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll say, uh, could you please lift that clock? <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, so this sets the lazy frequency. Uh, I gave this spiel at the beginning that will be the atoms that set the laser frequency so we can do this measurement where we shift the resonance uh, frequency of the cavity and how, ask how much did the frequency of the light change by. So here's the laser frequency, the frequency of the light coming out, and that's the change with some offset, and it's in hertz. Here's the shift in the cavity resonance frequency in kilohertz. Okay, so it's barely moving. Okay. Um, so it turns out if we tune our system just right, we can be as insensitive as uh, two times 10 to minus six. It's kind of a slope. Okay. So that's a huge reduction of cavity frequency noise. But there are actually three curves on there. And that's actually the next part of the talk. Uh, it depends on how we actually prepare the state, exactly what this frequency pulling coefficient is. They're still small. These, these lines are about 10 to minus 5, okay? a few times 10 to minus 5. But it, it depends on how many atoms at t equals 0 are in the optically excited state that sets that slope. And in fact, it changes some. So what's that about? Well, we started uh, talking with uh, Anne Maria Ray's group. And uh, Bi Hui, uh, she is here. And she's actually going to have a poster talking about the theory on this. Um, but in this system, uh, what we think we're seeing are um, mean field, at the mean field level, spin exchange interactions mediated by the cavity. Okay. And so the goal here, what we're thinking is, you know, can we actually use the cavity to create twists and gaps for generating entanglement and stabilization against single particle dephasing? Um, this is a story that maybe many people are, are familiar with, but um, in this system, um, if we're doing super radiance, and we begin with all the atoms in the excited state, the atoms, as the pulse comes out, they just, it's an overdamped inverted pendulum. They come, they come to the south pole. Why do, why do atoms go from the north pole to the south pole? It's because there's an electric field. There's a D dot E interaction. So what's happening is some quantum fluctuation causes a little bit of uh, field to be emitted into the cavity, and that creates a rotation axis that's perpendicular to the block vector, which then causes the atoms to rotate, which actually causes more radiation. And the, the rotation axis gets bigger and then it gets smaller. Okay. But it's perpendicular. If I move off resonance, okay, if I just tune my cavity off resonance, this cavity mode is essentially being driven by the atoms that are trying to radiate into it. But now, because I'm far from resonance, when I drive a harmonic oscillator off of resonance, there's a, there's a pi over 2 phase shift. And what that means is the self radiated field picks up a pi over 2 phase shift, which means it actually is now aligned like this. Okay. And so what that means is that uh, this block vector, it just needs a Robbie frequency, it would like to precess like this, if nothing else changed. But because the cavity is heavily damped, as soon as this thing moves this way, the cavity field immediately readjusts the phase of its electric field to follow. So in principle, this thing just kind of surfs along. Okay? This is what this whole business of tuning off resonance is. Okay? It's that you're actually you're, you're rotating the rotation axis in the system. So it turns out you can describe that in terms of um, some kind of dissipative term that falls off like 1 over detuning squared, and also a Hamiltonian-like term that looks like a J plus J minus uh, kind of Hamiltonian, where the coupling constant uh, in the large detuning limit falls off like 1 over detuning. So you can hope to make this dominate over that. That's the goal. Okay. Again, we're going to do this on the triplet P0 to single dot 0 transition. This is this millihertz line of transition. I'm going to skip over that. Um, let me talk about um, what is the effect of this Hamiltonian. Well, we can think about in the dynamics that we can rewrite this approximately as j squared, total j, minus jz squared. Okay. If we do that, then we can think of it as the jz squared. It's known as one axis twisting. 
which is like taking a big rubber ball and grabbing the North Pole and South Pole and twisting it in opposite directions. You'll deform the surface of the sphere in such a way that you can create squeezed or entangled states. The J-squared term says if I change the length of the block vector, which corresponds to, say, single particle per phase in the system, there's an energy cost associated with doing that. And so you are actually int introducing an energy gap between states of different J that suppresses a single particle dephasing. I'll point out that actually this uh, type of physics was ind independently proposed out of Vaughan's group uh, at the same time we were seeing in the squeeze states using this approach. So the first one is that we expect to see this one axis twisting. That should show up as a frequency shift that depends on the inversion of the atoms. We see that. A linear shift. We also see that it has a dispersive form, just like you expect with this coupling. And then we can also do a kind of gap spectroscopy where we can actually sense the fact that, say, states of different J actually develop an energy gap. And we do that in a Ramsey kind of way where we spend a little bit of time in a subradiant state and then map back, and then we can actually be sensitive to that phase. And so we can actually see this extra phase that accumulates as a result of spending time in states of lower J. I'm going to skip over. We can also do some experiments having to do with spin locking. But my very last science slide is going to be saying that we think that there's a really neat way that we can actually take advantage of these different spin manifolds to build two block vectors back to back to get coherent cancellation of the super radiance. We can actually reduce the super radiance to order by a factor of 1 over n, which means now it's actually at the spontaneous emission level with no collective enhancement. And yet you can still get squeezing or one axis twisting back dynamics. So now instead of being a chi j z squared term, it goes to chi j y squared. It's also interesting because it's squeezing closer to a phase basis than a population basis. But anyways, this is a work in progress, but we think this is really interesting. I didn't do this work. Uh, lots of people contributed to it. Uh, here are the students and postdocs that did it. Uh, on the Rubidium side, um, in particular, Kevin took a lead on a lot of the results shown today. On the Rubidium side, I'm sorry, on the Strontium side, Matt Norcia built up that experiment, took the lead. And now uh, uh, Juan Nina Silva has joined us from Jeff Kimball's group, and uh, Julie is also pushing on that. Um, we've collaborated with Anna Maria Ray's theory group, uh, June Lee down the hall in terms of these frequency comparisons, and also uh, Murray uh, in terms of the swept cooling, to see that cooling I think we need to talk about, as well as just thinking broadly about what are going to be the issues with super in our system. So with that, thank you. So for the emission uh, that you've shown in the presence of a magnetic field where you get multiple bursts, yeah. it actually looks very similar to these uh, atomic frequency pumps people use in uh, solid state optical memories. Have you considered connections? For instance, can you use this as a delay line for a memory element? Um, I think in a sense that what we can do is we can, um, it's a memory in the sense that what you can do is if you put these atoms in the cavity, the cavity sitting on resonance, the, you can think of this, there's a kind of Purcell, uh, collective Purcell enhancement that you rate. It's a collective in nature. Uh, and what this allows you to do is turn off that part, right? Uh, and then make it fast again. So in that sense, it's a memory. Uh, but in terms of the connections for actually doing like photon storage or things like that, no, we have it. In your first squeezing stuff, what actually sets the noise after you do your squeezing. Yeah. Why isn't it perfect? Why isn't it perfect? Uh, why is this not aligned? <laughs> yeah. um, so um, what what happens is when we when we try to optimize this, it's a question of, I have a three megahertz line. It's a question of how precisely can I measure that cavity frequency shift. And so it's three megahertz, and I need to start sending photons at the system. right? And I just, the more photons I send at the system, the more I'll be able to split that line. Okay. And so if you ask, what's your precision, it gets better and better um, until at some point you actually start uh, noticing that you're getting free space scattering in the system, which actually leads to a loss of signal. And I haven't, didn't have a chance to talk about it, but actually one of the critical things for getting to this level is we have to control some cavity optomechanical effects. There's a lot behind that experiment. Like Kevin sort of you know, uh, regale you, there, there are a lot of technical things to make that work well. But one of the other things are things like cavity optomechanics that you actually see at some point your measurement in precision, in precision gets worse because you can send, continue to send photons at the cavity. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm 
I'm wondering what 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 is the role of the dipole of the dispersive part of the dipole dipole interaction in determining the uh, the, the exact position of, of your of your frequency of, of you know this sterile line shape. Yeah. So you show I mean I'm talking about like one of our cube if the atoms are close enough or the sinusoidal dipole dipole made by the by the wave. Band. I mean if the atoms move a bit, would yeah, that yeah. mean that the line shape moves? So um, so in the limit that we're operating. Um, we expect that the uh, direct dipole-dipole transition, sort of like the near-field interactions, those are predicted to show up in optical last plots in much the same way they would show up here, and those are predicted to sort of kick in at sort of the millihertz kind of level of kinds of frequency shifts. Okay. Um, the more serious thing you might, so, so I think that the answer is yes to there, but we're not sensitive to them yet. They're about three orders of magnitude down from where we're at. Um, what those could do is they could also give you a broadening effect, but it turns out that in super radiance, uh, you actually get around that. You get laser light that's narrower than the single particle coherence time. Okay, it's kind of like saying it's an active optical oscillator. So if I take a um, crystal, which has a narrow uh, you know, line width associated with it, and I put in a positive feedback loop, the actual oscillator will be much narrower than the line width of that crystal as a result of positive feedback. It's an imprecise analogy, but it's not a bad analogy. It's the same thing here. The single atoms can have some kind of spread, um, you know, single particle dephasing, and it's okay. You'll overcome that and you'll average that down. So um, I think I kind of answered the question I wanted to answer. I'm not sure if I answered the other question. Do the atoms sit in, in a 1D optical lattice? So they're in a 1D optical lattice. So we don't have to worry about Doppler shifts uh, associated with the atoms moving along the cavity axis. They do move transverse to the cavity axis. But because you're moving nominally along a phase front, there's no Doppler shift associated with any of that. But do they have dipole dipole interactions mediated by the by the wave? Or, or do, do they sit in nodes? I mean, where do they have this kind of so the so there's a far field dipole dipole interaction, that's the cavity mode, and that's this whole like uh, self-radiated field that causes the torque. But then you might worry that there are other shifts uh, in the system which are associated with more of the near field interaction associated with it. So you you know, like you you open up uh, Jackson and like we, we look at the far field term, but of course there are all these near field terms. Like what about those? And those are the ones I'm claiming that are at the millihertz level or less at this point. And we're probing physics that are at about one hertz to hundred millihertz. So they're probably there, but they're about two orders of magnitude away. This is maybe something I should know. How far down is the second order Doppler shift? At the moment, I think the second order Doppler shift is kicking in at around um, around 100 millihertz, but that's the that's the average shift. Um, so again, in terms of the narrowness of the line, assuming that you're at a reasonable reasonable constant temperature, you can make that system on the air. That's what we want. I see. So, so the statement is it affects your accuracy, but if you're using this to as an intermediate, yes, yes then it's. Then and I think I, I think I, I may be off by more than maybe at 10 millihertz. It's a funny thing, like even if you have like a ground state wave function, like a laser pool into a ground state wave function, you think that's not moving. But in principle, there's a second order Doppler shift associated with that. So it's just a confinement, right? We'll give you a second order Doppler shift. Uh, uh, Dave Lyon and his group has run into that and Craig's for it in their um, ion, aluminum ion trap, I think. So these uh, frequency shifts you're seeing as a fraction of the population ratio, or really where you are on the block sphere. They remind me a lot of the spin optodynamic frequencies that we've been seeing uh, in our cavity experiment. And I think they're actually, in fact, very much the same thing. So um, you have your dipoles processing around the applied electric field. Um, in our experiment, we have spins that are processing about uh, the fictitious magnetic field of the light field, which is, of course, proportional to the electric field squared. But when you um, say we're processing around, uh, do you mean the atomic transition frequency? That that's the main D one. dot e. So D processes around e. Yeah, but that's the self-radiated field. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, fine. That's right. So it's a self-interaction. Right. Mm -hmm. So in our cavity setup, what what we what my what my spin dipoles are processing around is something which is like e squared because it's the AC star shift of the light. And I get e squared. One factor is from the coherent drive, and the second factor is from the radiation of the atoms into the cavity. And then do you get a homodyne up 
of the effect of the soft radiation as a result of the... And then the difference between those, is that roughly the long wave frequency, and the, or whatever attracts the yeah. motion of the spins? And then when we see similarly that if the spins are sitting, let's say, with the cavity, you know, whatever, in one setting, maybe they'll be sped up, their long wave procession will be sped up. On the bottom, they'll be slowed down, and in between, there's no shift. I totally believe that. I, I, I think that... Um, I just want to as is, as is without, actually the damping. Without getting into the details, like I'm not going to give you a warranty that yes, for sure, it's the exact same physics, right? But I believe it's totally doable. And I will say, like, I think all the physics we're seeing here, you can basically emulate with Raman transitions, right? It just so happened we had this very clean system where we had very good control over it, and it was yeah. pretty straightforward to see. I mean, in our paper, we, we wrote a few sentences about an analogy to cavity superradiance, and now I'm seeing how deep that analogy Well, I think is. in your experiment, is there a way to understand that what you're actually seeing are like superradiant cascades where you're going from like one MF level to the other stretch state? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so, um, let's take one or two more questions. Um, yeah. so, so, one uh, more kind of funny thing. You stabilize your cavity by feeding back on one of the piezos, right? Yes. So, what if the other mirror was the one that was moving? Does that introduce a Doppler shift? So, there is a first order Doppler shift. Um, and the way we actually correct for it, remember that we're stabilizing the cavity link. Yeah, but. but, but uh, yeah, no, I understand. But we're, we're feeding back to keep because we're, we're, we're doing this, but then we have center mass motion. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, we actually have to account for that in our path length stabilization. So, what we do is we go around the back side of the cavity and worse out to get it to work. You can't come out the end that the light comes out. You have to come and bounce light off the back side of the cavity to get the path of stabilization to work. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And the reason for that is, think about it. The way you keep vibrations from coming into the cavity link is by building a vibration isolation system, which means you're intrinsically floppy. Which means that the building, like, it sits almost in an inertial reference frame, and the building moves underneath it. So it's as bad as it's ever going to get, right? So you really need to track where are the cavity mirrors when you do your your phase referencing, like where's your plane you're defining phase comparison? Sounds like it's been a rough couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, uh, it has gone blisteringly fast. Um, this experiment has just kind of um, worked beyond expectations. So that's, I think, a good note to end on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much.